Thank you all. My name is Spencer Fluman. I am the uh, executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship here at Brigham Young University. And uh, on behalf of all of us at the Maxwell Institute, we welcome you. We know, too, that tonight's event is co-sponsored by two other units on campus, Ancient Near Eastern Studies. Uh, we're grateful to Eric Huntsman, uh, the director there, and Ancient Scripture, and Dana Pike, the chair of that department. Those three units have collaborated on this visit of uh, Professor Robert Alter to campus uh, today and tomorrow. A couple of uh, housekeeping things before we begin. Uh, we'd invite you to silence your electronics now. We are filming the event this evening, and so we'd like uh, little distraction as we can, uh, as we can have. Uh, please silence those electronics. There is an overflow uh, room set apart uh, here this evening for those that can't find a seat in 3250, if there are any uh, in the wings who would like to, to watch from that overflow, 3250 in this, uh, in this building. Um, in addition to uh, filming the event, which will be eventually available uh, for you to share, um, we, Dr. Alter is also going to appear on the Maxwell Institute podcast. So if you're not a follower of the podcast, please start. Uh, and uh, in a future uh, episode, he'll, he'll appear uh, being interviewed by our own Blair Hodges. Uh, also, there are uh, a limited number of Dr. Alter's books available, available for sale uh, this evening. They're in the back, and he has agreed to uh, take brief questions and sign books after uh, his remarks tonight, and so that's, that will be available to you if you'd like to uh, grab one or more of his books for purchase. Spencer, yes. 11 o'clock And 11 o'clock tomorrow morning... Uh, give me the location again, Eric, on that. Reynolds Auditorium and the Library. Reynolds Auditorium and the Library. Um, Dr. Alter will be pre presenting again. Uh, this is sponsored by Ancient Near Eastern Studies. Um, so students and others are welcome to attend there in the library tomorrow, 11 a.m. Thank you, uh, Dr. Huntsman, for that. Uh, as is our uh, custom at, at BYU, we'd like to start this evening's uh, event with a prayer before I introduce our speaker. Our, our prayer this evening will be given by Dr. Sharon Harris, an assistant professor of English at BYU and author of one of the forthcoming volumes of the Maxwell Institute's The Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introductions. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful that we can gather this evening. We're grateful for uh, Professor Alter being with us for the contributions he's made to uh, ancient scripture, for helping all of us understand it better. We're grateful for the community that we have together and that we can learn from him tonight. And we ask that thy spirit will be with us, that it will be with him, and that we'll be able to come away with a better understanding and better appreciation for thee and thy word. Uh, we ask for safety in everyone as they return this evening as well, and we say it's in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. To introduce our speaker this evening, Robert Alter is professor in the Graduate School and Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at the University of California at Berkeley, where he has taught since 1967. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Council of Scholars of the Library of Congress, and is past president of the Association of Literary Scholars and Critics. He has twice been a Guggenheim Fellow, has been a senior fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities, a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem, an Old Dominion fellow at Princeton University. He's written widely on the European novel from the 18th century to the present, on contemporary American fiction, and on modern Hebrew literature. He's also written extensively on literary aspects of the Bible. His 26 published books include two prize-winning volumes on biblical narrative and poetry, and award-winning translations of Genesis and of the five books of Moses. He has devoted book-length studies 
to Fielding, Stendhal, and the self-reflexive tradition on the novel. Books by him have been translated into 10 different languages. Among his publications over the past 25 years are Necessary Angels, Tradition and Modernity in Kafka, Benjamin, and Sholem. The David Story, a translation with commentary of First and Second Samuel. Canon and Creativity, Modern Writing and the Authority of Scripture. The Five Books of Moses, a translation with commentary. Imagined Cities. The Book of Psalms, a translation with commentary. Pen of Iron, American Prose in the King James Bible. The Wisdom Books, a translation and commentary. And Ancient Israel, the Former Prophets. He completed translation of the Hebrew Bible with a commentary that was published in 2018 as a three-volume set. In 2009, he received the Robert Kirsch Award from the Los Angeles Times for Lifetime Contribution to American Letters, and in 2013, the Charles Homer Haskins Prize for Career Achievement from the American Council of Learned Societies. In 2019, the American Academy of Arts and Letters conferred on him an award for literature. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Robert Alter. Thank you for your generous uh, welcome. Uh, this is the second time I've spoken at Brigham Young University. The first time was a while back. Uh, 20 some odd years ago, and I spoke in the Tuesday morning series in the basketball arena. Uh, and uh, this is a big enough audience for me. Uh, that was a huge one. Um, now, uh, many ambitious kids think, hey, someday I'd like to see my name in big letters, but I've never seen it in letters this big. <laughs> so I'm grateful to Brigham Young for that, that uh, orthographic, uh, typographic uh, welcome. Now, it probably occurs to some of you as a somewhat peculiar thing for uh, someone to undertake a translation of probably the world's most translated book. Um, the reason I did it, uh, at first not thinking I would do the whole thing, but ending up doing the whole thing, the, as the whole Hebrew Bible, is that I felt there was something wrong, in some instances radically wrong, with the existing translations. And uh, the... Um, the things that, are, well, the fundamental thing that, that is wrong is, is the following. The Hebrew Bible, although it has its boilerplate passages, it, 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 its uh, longueur, you know, the, the dreary sections, uh, as he's, uh, the French call it, um, it is a, an amazing set of literary documents. That, that is, the uh, uh, prose style in the narratives is of a, an extraordinarily high level of subtlety, sophistication, uh, and at times uh, brilliance. And the poetry is among the greatest poetry that's come down to us from the ancient world. It's a little puzzling because to put things in perspective, we all think ancient Israel is a great thing. That is, it's the fountainhead of the three great monotheistic faiths. But in fact, it was a backwater in the ancient world. It's a tiny sliver of land sandwiched in between uh, vast empires to the uh, west, I'm sorry, to the east and to the south. And from what we now know through archaeology of the material culture uh, of those surrounding uh, empires, it was pretty rudimentary. That is, we have the pyramids in Egypt, the ziggurats in, uh, uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, we, we have 
the wonderful Assyrian base reliefs and so on and so forth. And you look at what well, we have of visual art, for example, in ancient Israel, and it's rather primitive. It's like stick drawings. And yet this tiny culture produced writers of genius who far eclipsed uh, any of their neighbors uh, and are certainly on the level of the, the, the greatest poets and playwrights and so forth that the Greeks produced in a very different mode. I, don't, I can't explain this. It's one of those mysteries of culture. Uh, but I would say this. Another niggling question that some of you may have is that, after all, the, the Bible is a, a set of literary books. Uh, isn't, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a set of religious books. Isn't the literary fashioning of these texts icing on the cake, some kind of purely decorative thing? And here my unflagging answer is no. That, that, that is, uh, for reasons we cannot fathom, these writers, driven by a new monotheistic vision of reality, felt that the way to convey that vision was through highly artful prose and through often dazzling and moving poetry. So my contention is that a reading of the Bible and a translation of the Bible uh, that doesn't do any justice to the literary artifice of the Bible is misrepresenting its meanings, blunting its, its meanings, not giving us the full sense of what the biblical writers wanted to say about creation, God, uh, history, the, the realm of morality, and so forth. Now, what's wrong with the translations? Uh, that is, the, the existing translations. Most of what's wrong, and I'll be illustrating that momentarily, has to do with the translations ignoring the literary fashioning of the Hebrew and running roughshod over it and making subtle and resonant uh, sentences into banal sentences, into sentences that sound like something from a bad newspaper article written yesterday. <laughs> but there's also a problem, and I'll start off with this, uh, of um, accuracy. Now, obviously, anyone would think about a translation that the first obligation of a translator is to convey in the, the target language, in our case English, as best as he or she can do the precise meanings of the original, the source language. The fact is that there are far more errors, sometimes grave errors, among the modern translators than you would think. Well, I immediately concede that over the past century, scholarship has made great strides in uh, the precise understanding of Biblical Hebrew. That is, it is now understood far better than it was in the early 17th century when the King James Version was uh, completed. But there are still things that are wrong and I think that uh, a lot of these things that are wrong have to do with the translators not taking into consideration the clues that the literary context, the narrative context and the poetic context give to what the original is saying. So I'm going to be, begin with words. Now, let me state a, a very simple methodological principle. That if you translate a novel of 150,000 words, 
if you get some words wrong, nobody's going to notice. And it's not going to make much difference in the overall effect of the novel. Uh, this is not true of the Hebrew Bible because it uses so few words. So every word choice counts. And if you don't represent the, the word choice faithfully, you're distorting the original. Let me offer actually an example from, from uh, a novel. Uh, in Madame Bovary, for those of us who read it in French, uh, the color blue is associated with Emma Bovary's uh, romantic fantasies. Either the, the simple word French, bleu, bleu, or the word bleuâtre, which means something like bluish, keep cropping up in her interior monologue. And the first time we see her, I believe she's wearing a blue dress. In any case, she has a, a, a semi-transparent blue parasol, which filters the, the sunlight on her face. Now, let us say a, a wise guy translator thinks, well, it's a little boring repeating blue all the time. And, and let's look at, at the context. Uh, isn't in this particular episode aquamarine better? Or, or azure? Or, or uh, turquoise? Th this push to improve the original, of course, kills the original. Uh, and w would eliminate the color motif of blue that was so important for uh, Flaubert. And that's what the, the modern translations of a, a horror of repeating anything have done again and again. Okay, so let's begin with words. Okay, now here, here's a fun one. It was fun for me to realize when I was a translator. In the Samson story, Many of you will remember, I know this is a biblically knowledgeable audience, um, Samson is obliged to invite 30 Philistine male guests to his wedding. It's a seven-day celebration. And he poses his famous riddle to them, saying that if they can solve the riddle, he will give each of them uh, a sumptuous cloth, and a change of garments. And that the first word, I shall give you 30 fine cloths and 30 khalifot of garments. Now, khalifot means changes of. Absolutely unambiguous. This is never a word that's been in doubt in the, the Hebrew language. And by the way, in modern Hebrew, khalifa means suit, a man's suit. So then, uh, the um, uh, the wedding guests coerce Samson's Philistine wife to give over to them the secret of the uh, the solution to the the riddle, and when when they announce it to him, he's furious and says, "Had you not plowed with my shepherd, you would not have found my riddle." And of course, there's a kind of sexual innuendo in that. You've been messing around with my wife. Uh, so he goes off in, in a rage to the city of Ashkelon, one of five um, Philistine cities along the coastal plain. And he went down to Ashkelon and struck down from among them 30 men and took their chalitzot, you see, it's a very similar word to khalifot, but the middle consonant is different. Instead of an F sound, you have a Tz sound. You see, khalitzot. Now, all the translations that I've looked at, going back to the King James Version, all the moderns, figure that, well, the, the wager was for a change of garments. So chalitzot must be a variant form or, or some kind of alternative synonym 
to Khalifot, and it means the same thing. So they translate it as a change of garments, as tunics. One translation, Mr. Modern one, translated as belts. I don't think they wore belts in the ancient Near East. And so it, it's, it's a, what are they up to? So I then consulted the Hebrew Concordance, which has been my greatest guide to translating the Bible. There is only one other place in the entire Hebrew Bible in which this word chalitzot appears, and that is in 2 Samuel. I'll, I'll reconstruct the narrative context very briefly. A civil war is going on between the house of David and the house of Saul after Saul's death. Dave, I'm sorry, uh, Saul's savvy, battle-hardened commander, Abner, is fleeing on the battlefield from Asael, who is said to be, he, he's on David's side, he's the brother of uh, Joab, David's commander, and he's said to be as fleet as one of the deers uh, of the field. So Abner knows he can't get away from him, and he doesn't want to kill him because he knows if he does this, it will spark a vendetta between him and Asael's brother Joab. So he says, he tries to persuade him to turn away. Uh, he doesn't succeed, by the way, uh, and when Asael persists, uh, Abner pulls an old warrior's trick, which is he stops suddenly, thrusts his spear under his, his arm backwards into the soft belly of Asael and kills him. Th these are not stories for Sunday school. Uh, so, uh, but what does he say? He says to uh, Asael, swerve you to your right or your left and seize for yourself one of the lads, and take you his chalitza, the same word that appears with Samson at Ashkelon. So what is a chalitza? Uh, the King James Version knew, partly because they were following the Septuagint, and partly because, like the Septuagint, they read their Homer. Now, all of you have read your Homer, so you know that in the Iliad, what is it that a warrior takes from his slain foe on the battlefield? He takes his armor, not his tunic, uh, not his cape or anything like that, but his armor. Uh, you remember uh, um, uh, um, Patroclus takes uh, Achilles, um, I'm sorry, Achilles takes uh, Patroclus's armor. Uh, so uh, then I thought about the etymology of the word. There's another word in Biblical Hebrew with the same root, chalutz, which means um, military vanguard. It's a fighter's elite. So I said, that's it. A chalitza is what is worn by one of the elite fighters in the vanguard, some special kind of armor. So this then throws a whole new light on the, this moment in the Samson story. What is Samson saying by, by killing these guys? They are not ordinary, 30 ordinary Philistines. They are 30 warriors. He kills them and he brings back to the wedding guests 30 sets of armor, which are far more valuable than 30 changes of garments. So it's both a way of sticking it to the Philistines and also delivering a kind of warning. You see what I did to your warriors. I could do the same to you. Uh, in order to get this, as I said, no uh, translation has gotten this. You have to look at the, the literary context. And here, Homer is a little bit of assistance in understanding the, military, the literary context. Now, 
Here's a very small example. Uh, when God is speaking to Moses uh, right uh, around the time of the, the um, uh, delivering the Ten Commandments, he says, I am about to come to you in Av He'anan. Now, Anan means cloud. So we know that God is revealing himself in the cloud. But what kind of cloud? Uh, the first word, all translations think is the same as a somewhat similar Hebrew word, Aveh, which means, it has one more syllable, which means thick. So they all translate, I'm about to come to you in a thick cloud or a dense cloud. But that is not what the biblical word Av means. It's another word for cloud. Uh, it's almost like saying, I'm about to come to you in the thunderhead of the cloud, which of course you can't translate that way. So I then discovered a pattern, uh, and I gathered maybe 30, 40 instances, in which two nouns that are synonyms are joined together um, in uh, the X of Y, like the house of David, but that's not synonyms. Uh, two nouns uh, joined together synonyms. It's an intensifier or a superlative. So the thunderhead of the cloud means something l like a super cloud, a, a mythologically grand cloud. And after some floundering, I decided to translate it as I'm about to appear to you in, to come to you in the utmost cloud. But it, it gives this, this story a, um, uh, a, a mythological resonance it would not have otherwise. Now here's one more example uh, of uh, the top two texts in which um, the, in this case, the poetic context gives you a clue. It's David's victory psalm, probably not David's, but ascribed to David, at the, late in the, the in Second Samuel. And you gave me your shield of rescue, your anot made me many. Now what does anot mean? Nobody knows. I think I know. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be arrogant, but sometimes you feel, yeah, I got it. Um, the, the verb anot usually means to answer. So some translations say, your answering power made me many. Um, the uh, uh, others, uh, Fudge it, or say that your providence made me many, or, or whatever. Now, the context of this line of poetry is a series of quasi-miraculous arms that God gives to his chosen warrior. That is a bow of bronze and, and so forth. So is this some kind of uh, weapon? There's one other place in the Bible uh, it's the story of the golden calf in which Anot appears. Um, that, that is, uh, uh, Joshua says to Moses, not the sound of Anot in triumph and not the sound of Anot in feet, defeat, a sound of Anot I hear. Now, maybe that's actually uh, Moses says that. Well, Anot has a second meaning besides to answer. It means to speak up or to call out. Like again and again, that verb is used in Job to introduce Job's speech when, when he's not answering anybody. He's just speaking up. So it occurred to me, especially if you look at the military context of the parallel uh, text from Exodus, that Anot, a crying out of victory, a crying out in defeat, no, I hear crying out, I don't know what it's all about, 
that anot can mean battle cry. And if we go back now to Samuel, your anot made me many, your battle cry made me many. That is, my troops might have been few, but with your battle cry, which strikes fear in the heart of the enemy, maybe a battle cry like, Sword of the Lord uh, and of David, uh, you uh, made me as though I were many. Okay, uh, now uh, something that doesn't have to do with a mistake in translation, a, a mistake in understanding, but a mistake in translation choice. When Hagar is banished to the wilderness with the child Ishmael, she's carrying water in a water skin and the water runs out, they're in the blazing heat uh, of the desert, uh, near Egypt evidently, and uh, she's sure her only son is going to die. So she um, uh, runs off, and this is the way it's reported. And when the water in the skin was gone, and here's the verb, vatashlech, the child under one of the bushes, and went off and sat down at a distance, for she thought, let me not see when the child dies. Now, the translations variously render this verb as uh, she lay the child down under one of the bushes, she set him down under the one of the bushes, she put him under one of the bushes. The King James Version is a bit better, but it's still off. She thrust him under one of the dishes. However, bushes. However, this verb in the Bible means one thing and one thing only. It means to fling. Uh, that is, it's a verb that's used when Pharaoh tells the Egyptians, every male child you shall fling into the Nile. So what's going on? I think that the, the writer is a lot bolder than his translators. That is, the translator said, well, she's a mother, she's not going to fling her son down. But I think what the writer understood w was her desperate psychology, that she's sure the child's going to die. And uh, so in a kind of paroxysm of maternal despair, she flings him down under one of the bushes and then runs off to a distance. And that's the way I translate, I think, more honestly conveying the striking force of the Hebrew. Okay, uh, one, okay, two more word examples and then we'll go on to other kinds of examples. Tamar's, the beautiful Tamar, David's daughter, is lusted after by her half-brother Amnon. This is another uh, story that's not told, uh, taught in Sunday school. So he, he contrives to, um, uh, he pretends that he's ill and that he needs Tamar to come and provide food for him. And when she comes to his inner chamber, his bedchamber, he seizes her and rapes her and all kinds of disasters flow from that dreadful act. Uh, it wasn't invented by Harvey Weinstein, you see. Uh, so, uh, let Tamar, my sister, pray come, and Tavreni, that's a verb, with food, and prepare the birya, that's a food word, before my eyes. Now, there are two ordinary ways to say food in Biblical Hebrew. One is ochel, which means something you eat, that's a normal word, and then uh, also lechem, bread, which is a, a synecdoche, standing for all kinds of food. The writer uses neither of these words. He uses a word that occurs maybe half a dozen times in this episode, and scarcely any place else, a few places. But again, consulting my trusty concordance, I see that every place in which 
birya or the cognate verb is used, it has to do with giving food to somebody who's been doing poorly or who is, has been fasting. In this case, Amnon has been do, pretending that, that he's doing poorly. So I said, it's flat to translate it as food, as everybody does. And I groped for a word, you don't, don't always get the right one. I said, it couldn't be chicken soup because the chicken hadn't been domesticated yet. So uh, I settled for nourishment uh, and let him nourish, with, uh, nourish me with food and prepare the nourishment before my eyes. Oh, I'm sorry. The last problem is the pervasive one, nefesh. Now, we, we have to accept the fact that the ancient Hebrews construed the world, conceived the world, in ways rather different from the way that we do. So, um, this is a word that's always translated as soul, S-O-U-L. Uh, probably following the King James Version, uh, I'm sorry, probably following the Vulgate, the Old Latin translation, which translates it as anima. Now it's true that in later Hebrew, post-biblical Hebrew, nefesh comes to mean soul. But the biblical writers have no notion of soul. I hope this won't shock you. That is, they have no notion of any kind of split between body and soul, and really no notion of an afterlife. They're, what happens when you die is rather like what happens uh, in Homer. So, uh, nefesh comes from a, uh, it, well, it's an onomatopoeic word. It means breath. You remember God breathes his breath into the clay that, that is uh, the first man and gives him life. So nefesh is the life breath. Uh, by, uh, and uh, in general I, have, I find that I needed to translate as life breath or, or even just life. Uh, but it also has a couple of other meanings. That is, by um, metonymy, that is likening two concepts because they're contiguous, they touch upon each other. It means throat or neck, either inside or because the throat is the passageway for the, the life breath. And here I, I chose uh, an example which may be a little provocative because, again, I don't think others have rendered it this way. In Psalm 63, God, my God, for you I search, my nefesh thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a land waste and parched with no water. So what does nefesh mean here? I, if you look at the context, that is, the context of thirst, and then especially the, uh, uh, the uh, setting in a land waste and parched with no water, uh, and uh, the parallel between nefesh and flesh, I think the most likely meaning of nefesh is thirst. My, my uh, th 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 this throat, excuse me, my throat thirsts for you. Now, my soul thirsts for you is beautiful. I sort of uh, regretted giving that up, but I didn't think that's what it meant. And here is another kind of spirituality, a spirituality as consistent in the, in the Bible, anchored in the human body. My throat thirsts for you. That is, just as a man almost dying from thirst in the blazing heat of the desert thirsts for water, I thirst for you, O oh God. Okay, let's move on. Now, 
uh, dialogue. Uh, it dawned on me something that I hadn't quite seen when I wrote a book on biblical uh, narrative many years ago, that the true precursor to dialogue in the novel is dialogue in the Hebrew Bible. Now, uh, some of you may say, well, don't people say moving things in their speeches in Homer? They do, but their speeches. There's not that kind of give and take between two characters. Some of those speeches go on for dozens and dozens of lines. And th there's not that inflection of language to reflect the nature of the speaker, which is really what novelistic dialogue is all about. So, uh, the first encounter between uh, Esau and Jacob that's rendered in dialogue. It's, it's the first piece of dialogue for each of them. And Jacob prepared a stew, and Esau came from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, let me gulp down some of this red, red stuff, for I am famished. And Jacob said, sell now your birthright to me. And Esau said, look, I'm at the point of death, so why do I need a birthright? And Jacob said, swear to me now. Okay, uh, it's clear that Esau is represented almost satirically as a man of appetite, impatient appetite. Uh, so impatient that he can't even think of the, the ordinary Hebrew word for stew. So in the Hebrew, it's literally this red, red, but that didn't sound quite right in English, so I added stuff. A, a couple of modern translations also say red stuff, but they don't repeat the red, red, which I think is important. But then let's look at Jacob's speech and the very first words the character says in biblical narrative generally are characterizing, a way, an uh, exposition of character. He says, sell now your birthright to me. Pay attention to the word order. Sell now, uh, sell, okay, the imperative verb, now, not tomorrow, not next week, but now I want to close the deal. And then the freighted subject, the fraught subject of the sale, your birthright. And then at the very end of the syntactic change, to me, the chain, to me, is sort of like waiting for a trap to spring shut. So what do we have here? We have the, the impatient, uh, inarticulate Esau, and we have Jacob, who is not, no angel. That is, there's something disturbingly calculating about him. He's calculated each word he's saying and the order in which he puts it in order to spring the trap shut on his brother. Okay, uh, Abraham has come to the kingdom of Gerar and uh, passing Sarah off as his sister and she's taken into the king's harem. And God came to Abimelech in a night dream and said to him, you are a dead man because of the woman you took as she is another's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, My Lord, will you say, slay a nation, even if innocent? Did not she say to me, she is my sister? And she, she too said, he is my brother. Okay, um, the first thing is God's abruptness in the night vision. You are a dead man. The Hebrew is even better, of course. It's two words, uh, three syllables, hincha uh, met, which literally would be, you, uh, uh, here you are dead. Uh, uh, you're dead. Um, I thought that was maybe a little too blunt, so uh, I translate, you're a dead man. Then 
uh, uh, Avimelech says something that sounds a little incoherent. My Lord, will you slay a nation even if innocent? That's a weird way to put it. Now, a nation, he's probably talking about himself. As, as the body, the, the monarch who's the, the embodiment of the nation. But um, the way he puts it has to make us think of the preceding story in this chain in Genesis, which is when Abraham tries to bargain with God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, Will you slay a nation, even if innocent? So the, the, those words are coming back. And then uh, Abimelech completes his speech by saying, she, she too said, that's where the Hebrew sounds. That is, it's a splutter of indignation. And you have to get that in English. Again, uh, translators tend to assume that everything is regular and uh, no splutters in, in the Hebrew, so uh, th they erase this. Uh, okay, here's a, a, a more extreme example in dialogue. David's forces have defeated the rebe re rebellious Absalom's forces and even though David has given instructions to do no harm to Absalom, uh, Joab has contrived to, to have Absalom killed, you remember, dangling from the tree. So, uh, a, uh, a fast runner from a priestly family named Achimaas sprints across the, the Transjordanian plain to bring the news of the victory to David. Blessed is the Lord your God, says Achimaz, who has delivered over the men who raised their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is it well with the lad Absalom? In the Hebrew, there's something I couldn't translate. It's Hashalom Lanaar Av Shalom. That is, there's a Shalom component in the name Absalom. And Achimaaz said, I saw a great cat to send the king's servant Joab and your servant, I know not what. And the king said, to, said, turn aside, stand by. Now, every single preceding translation somehow makes coherence out of this incoherence. Because they assume the Bible always has to be coherent. You know, it's our canonical text, so it couldn't be gibberish, but in fact, it's deliberately gibberish. That, that is, Achimas is terrified to tell David what has happened to his son. So he stumbles and stutters and goes into a fog of words. And David realizes he's going to get nothing out of this guy. So he says, turn aside, stand by. Uh, and again, I don't think any previous translation has dared to uh, convey the incoherence. Okay, Th this is um, trickier, but um, I, in my most successful moments, I had fun with this. The Hebrew, both the prose and the poetry, especially the poetry, is full of sound play and word play. Uh, so to begin with, this is um, Psalm 30, uh, in which the speaker in the psalm recalls the prayer he recited to God in his de desperation when he thought he was going to die probably uh, of a, a near fatal illness. And so he said to God, what profit in my blood in my going down death word. Now the King James Version renders the first half of the line as follows. What profit is there in my blood? Now you hear all those syllables. It wrecks the, the rhythm. The, the, what profit is in my blood has no rhythm. The Hebrew sounds like this. Ma betza bidami. 
And it occurred to me, you don't need the is there. If you drop it, you get what profit in my blood. Exactly the same cadence as the Hebrew. Now, at the end of Psalm 30, here's another challenge. Uh, you have turned my misspade to a machol for me. A misspade is a chant or maybe speech of mourning, M-O-U. Um, and the word for dance is machol. So you have two words that begin with the phoneme M, misped machol. As I read the poem, it struck me this is really important to, to the psalmist, because what it does is to demonstrate phonetically God's power to take a negative condition, misped mourning, and to flip it to its opposite, a positive uh, condition, rejoicing, <coughs> dancing, machol. And then I felt this is one of those rare moments when you get lucky as a translator. I said, hey, there's a very good word in English for a chant of mourning that begins with a D. So I happily translated, you have turned my dirge to a dance for me. Okay, now a harder challenge is, is actual wordplay. Uh, in Isaiah 5, uh, God speaking to Israel says, uh, speaking, uh, I'm sorry, it's refer, referring to God. He hoped for mishpat and look mispach. Mishpat means justice. Mispach means something like a plague, a blight. And you see Isaiah's word play. He does this repeatedly. That, that is a positive term, mishpat justice, turned into a negative term, mishpach blight, to demonstrate on the level of sound the 180 degree perversion of values in the kingdom of Judah. So I came up with, um, he hoped for justice, and look, jaundice. Now, uh, probably misbach is any kind of blight, but I, I thought that jaundice was a pretty good stand-in because of its closeness to justice. The second half of the line I stretched a little more. Uh, uh, he hoped for tzaka, and look, tzaka. Now, tzaka means justice or righteousness, no, it means righteousness, and tzaka means scream, which is really powerful. What I did was not quite so powerful, sometimes you compromise, and also um, uh, a little bit looser in the literalness. He, uh, for righteousness, and look, wretchedness. Now, wretchedness is not as good as a scream, and it's not exactly a scream, but when you see, see, see things being really bad, you, you want to scream. Okay. Rhythm. This is a kind of in discovery I made as I translated the very first chapter of Genesis. A discovery about what, what needed to be done. Um, I had made a little mental checklist over the years uh, of important features of Hebrew style in the Bible that had to be dealt with, like uh, level of diction, word play, word order, and so forth. But there was one I left out, and I'll explain. And God made the two great lights, the great light for dominion of day, and the small light for dominion of night, and the stars. I translated it that way without thinking. Then I stopped myself cold, and I said, what do I do? Dominion. All the other translations, you can check, say something like, to rule over, to govern. One modern translation actually translated to dominate the day, which is really terrible, because 
the verb dominate should appear in a sentence like, after World War II, the Soviet Union dominated the smaller states of Eastern Europe. It isn't what, what the uh, sun and the moon do to day and night. Um, so, uh, but why dominion? Well, first of all, the Hebrew is not an infinitive, as everybody translates it, but it's a, a verbal noun. So, dominion is also a noun. But then I realized there was a more compelling reason, the rhythm. I'm going to recite the, this phrase in the Hebrew. Et ha-maor ha-gadol l'memshelet ha-yom, v'et ha-maor ha-katon l'memshelet ha-layla, v'et ha-kochavim. Again, in my, uh, the great light for dominion of day and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. So the cadence of my version is almost the same as the Hebrew cadence. Well, why is this important? You know, you know the cadence, that's the stuff that, that, that literature professors fool around with, but it has nothing to do with the meaning. I think it has a lot to do with the meaning. As the priestly writer, his vision of creation is of beautiful orderliness, of things progressing from day one to the sixth day and then the Sabbath day after it with chorus-like repetitions, expressing his sense that creation is a harmonious thing. And I think that lovely cadence in this sentence is an embodiment in sound of his sense of cosmic order. So it, it confirms his vision of creation subliminally. Let's move on. Okay, word order. Now, this is something sometimes you can't do because the, uh, the rules for word or order in English and in Hebrew are somewhat different. Like the, the, in Biblical Hebrew, um, uh, the noun object of the verb usually comes before the verb, and you often cannot do that in Hebrew, in English. But let's look at these two instances. Me, you have bereaved. Oh, this is, uh, let me set the narrative context. Joseph's uh, ten brothers have come back, or nine of them have, from their first journey to Egypt. They have been forced to leave Simeon in Egyptian captivity as a hostage. And the man who rules over all Egypt, because they don't know he's Joseph, has said that he would not see their face again unless they brought down Benjamin, his one whole brother. So how does Jacob respond? Me you have bereaved. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and Benjamin you would take. It is I who bear it all. Now, uh, this is not the normal word order for English, right? Me you have bereaved. Uh, a couple of modern translators said, it, it, it is I whom you have be bereaved, which doesn't quite have the same force. This is what simply what we call a syntactic inversion. Now, are syntactic inversions permissible in a 21st century translation of the Bible? I would say absolutely. That is, they're not so alien to us. If we go back in English poetry to a little bit before the modernist revolution in poetry, which introduced free verse, there's syntactic inversion all over the place. Like a, a, a poem that many of you probably studied in, in uh, high school. Uh, Keats's On First Looking into Chapman's Homer begins, Much have I wandered in the realms of gold. That's not a normal order, right? You would say, I, I've wandered much in the realms of gold. 
But uh, as a poet, uh, Keats wanted to put the much up front. And I think that, to begin with, using syntactic inversion gives a slightly old-fashioned coloration without being phony antique to the, the language of the translation. And that's appropriate, again, because you don't want to the, the Bible to sound like a government directive or like the daily newspaper. But uh, why is it here? Because the Hebrew is unusual. That is the normal way in Biblical Hebrew to say you have bereaved me is to take the verb to bereave, shakel, to conjugate it as you have bereaved, and then to put the me at the very end uh, as uh, a, a suffix. It would sound like this, shikaltuni, one word. But instead, the writer decided to break out the object of the verb bereave and stick it at the beginning of the speech, me, you have bereaved. And I think that's part of his characterization of Jacob. That is, old Jacob at the mercy of his sons becomes the prima donna of paternal grief. And he's constantly putting himself center stage. Me, you have bereaved. It is I who bear it all. Now, here's a, a simple example. I'm getting to the end uh, from poetry, where, where there's lots of uh, syntactic inversion. Isaiah says, or has God say, sons I have nurtured and raised, but they rebelled against me. The Hebrew, banim gidalti vromanti mehem pash uvi. Now, the very first word of the sentence is sons. And I think that by framing God's words in this way, uh, Isaiah, who was a powerful prophet and also a great poet, wanted to convey the, the sense that they're sons, they're my sons, they're my special beloved uh, kin. And I tried to raise these sons up, but they betrayed me. So the sons has to come first. And this happens hundreds of times in biblical poetry. OK, now a different kind of word order, which all the translations mess with, because they don't see how strategically important it is. In Judges 3, the guerrilla leader, uh, Ehud, uh, assassinates the king of Moab. Uh, Israel at that moment, at least his tribe of Israel, being subjugated by Moab. So, uh, and he does it by, he's left-handed, and the king doesn't realize he's a lefty. And under, strapped to his right thigh, is a short sword. And when he tells the, the king that it's a secret word, a word of God, the king leans forward excitedly and he whips out the short sword and stabs him in the belly. Now, then Ehud makes an exit in some way we've never figured out through a side entrance. And his courtiers wait outside, the door's locked. And they wait, and they wait, and nothing happens. So they get concerned. And they take a key, and they took the key and opened the doors, and look, their master was fallen to the ground, dead. This um, sentence is told from their visual point of view, their visual and their emotional point of view. So, um, the, um, the word order is crucial. They open the door. First, they see it's their master, the Eglon king of Moab. Then, then they realize he's fallen to the ground. 
and then at the end of the syntactic chain, there. And, and um, w when you render that, uh, typically as the translators do, the, they saw their dead king lying on the ground. You lose all the, the immediacy, the impact of the Hebrew. Now, finally, uh, I think this is my last, I'll take this as my last example. Uh, the Akedah story, the story of the binding of Isaac. God speaks to Abraham. Quite famously, Abraham doesn't respond, he just obeys. And God says something horrendous to him. He says, take prey, your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac. Now, the order of the words is, again, crucial to the impact of the dialogue. God begins by saying, take prey. He uses the polite particle of entreatment, na, which means something like, pray, please. Uh, but then, what does he say? He says, your son. The, the Midrash of late antiquity uh, understood the importance of the, the word order. They invented a dialogue which does not exist in the biblical text uh, along this order. God says to Abraham, take your son. Abraham answers him, but I have two sons. And he says, you're only one. And Abraham says, but this one is an only one to his mother, and this one is an only one to this mother, his mother. And he says, whom you love. And in a wrenching piece of invented dialogue, Abraham says, are there divisions in love? Divisions in compassion? Of course, I love both my sons. And then Isaac, at the end of the syntactic chain, he's now cornered, uh, um, forced to recognize the terrible fact that he's being asked to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. So, uh, I could go on with other examples but I think that I will cease and desist here. What I've tried to represent is that there's much more going on in these stories and poems than any casual reading will uh, give you. And there's much more going on than almost all the translations tell you. They obscure what is powerful, what is subtle, what, what is uh, psychologically nuanced in the original. And by doing this, they fulfill that old, uh, painfully fulfill the old Italian uh, remark that, that a translator is a traitor. Uh, with all the imperfections in my own work, I've tried not to be a traitor. Thank you. Thank you.